Today's topic is time. How is going forwards in time different from going backwards in time? First, I'll show you how to extract an egg from a batch of cookies. First, take the cookies, put them back in the oven, and unbake the cookies. Next, take the raw cookie dough, put it in a bowl, and unmix the ingredients. Finally, grab an eggshell and uncrack the egg. Oh, and you need to be going backwards in time for this to work. Why is going forwards in time different from going backwards in time? Why can you dive into a pool, but not out of a pool? Why can you break a glass, but you cannot unbreak it? Why is it so easy to mix things, but so hard to unmix them? You might think that the laws of physics are very different when you go backwards in time, but they're not. They're almost all exactly the same. The laws of motion are the same, gravity is the same, light's the same, electricity is the same, quantum mechanics is the same. They're all the same going backwards in time. What's different is that the universe is getting more disorganized. What do I mean by this? Well, there's a more precise term called entropy that I will explain. But roughly speaking, entropy is disorder and disorder is increasing. First, think about how objects can move. A moving object has energy. The faster it moves, the more energy it has. When an object is hot, the atoms in the object are moving fast and fast objects have energy. This is heat energy. Heat energy comes from the atoms randomly moving around. This kind of motion is very disorganized and random. There are other kinds of motion. If you drop a rock from the building, the whole rock falls down. This is organized motion. If you accelerate a car, the whole wheel rotates and the car moves forward. This is organized motion. Trillions of molecules are all moving in the same direction. Organized motion is low entropy. Random chaotic motion, like heat, is high entropy. The study of heat and motion is called thermodynamics. Thermo means heat, and dynamics means motion. There are two very important laws that we will be discussing. The first law of thermodynamics is that energy cannot be created or destroyed. The second law is that entropy or disorder is always increasing. So while energy cannot be destroyed, energy is constantly becoming more disorganized and less useful. When you're driving a car and you hit the brakes, your brakes slow the car down by friction. The organized motion of the car is turned into heat. When you fill up your car, you have lots of organized energy. After you drive around town, the energy is lost as heat and it's almost impossible to get it back. When you jump into a pool, this organized motion creates a big wave, which turns into little waves, which turns into the random motion of the water. It turns into heat. Energy is constantly becoming more random and less useful. Useful energy is lost to heat in pretty much every mechanical process. Another way to say this is that entropy is increasing. Let's consider another way that disorder is increasing. It's much easier to mix things up than to unmix them. Here I have a set of cubes, half are red and half are blue. Now, real world systems are very complicated and we often want to simplify a system to just a few numbers. So here, we're gonna look at different arrangements of cubes, but we're only gonna keep track of one number. We'll call this number the macro state. The macro state will be the number of red cubes on the left side of the grid. Right now, there are zero red cubes on the left. These colors are very organized. This is low entropy. If I shake up the cubes, the colors get mixed. This is high entropy. Entropy naturally goes up. Why does this happen? How many possible ways can there be zero red cubes on the left? There's just one. Now, how many possible ways can there be one red cube on the left and one blue cube on the right? There are 18 spots for the red cube and 18 for the blue cube. So that's 18 times 18 equals 324 possibilities. We'll call each of these possibilities a microstate. There are 324 microstates for a macrostate of one, since we have one red cube on the left. 
Now, how many microstates have nine red cubes on the left? There are a lot more of these. Each side has 18 spots, and we choose nine of them, so that's 18 choose nine squared. So we have 2.3 billion microstates. A macrostate with many microstates has high entropy. You're much more likely to end up in one of these 2 billion microstates when you mix up the cubes. And you're very unlikely to end up in one of the few microstates with low entropy. If you start a system in low entropy, it naturally goes to high entropy because there are so many more states that have high entropy. Only a few states are organized. Most of them are very random. Systems naturally go from low entropy to high entropy. It's a law of nature, but it's a strange law of nature because it's statistical. It is possible to go from high to low entropy, but this is very, very extremely unlikely. This one fact that entropy is always increasing explains so many things. It's why air is evenly distributed. Suppose we have two boxes with two different kinds of gases. Remove the barrier between the boxes and the two gases mix. It's almost impossible to put the gases back in their original box. We have moved from low entropy to high entropy. Now let's think about heat. What if we have two boxes and we heat one of them up? One box is now hotter than the other one. If we remove the barrier between the boxes, heat transfers from the hot box to the cold box until they're the same temperature. This is something you know. You know that if you put a hot object next to a cold object, the heat's gonna mix until the two objects become the same temperature. This happens because the objects are made of molecules and the heat is much more likely to mix than to stay in any one spot. The fact that entropy always increases is the second law of thermodynamics. This law has many practical applications. It helps explain how refrigerators, car engines, and steam engines work. And that's how the theory got started. A French engineer named Sadi Carnot was trying to understand steam engines at a very basic level. A steam engine heats up steam and turns some of that heat energy into mechanical power. How does a steam engine get any useful work out of these molecules randomly bouncing around? Imagine we have a cylinder filled with air. We connect the cylinder to a heat source. The air then gets hotter. The air molecules start moving faster. The air expands, and this pushes a piston forward. Then we cool down the cylinder. The air molecules slow down, the air compresses, and the piston moves backwards. We then repeat this process. We heat the cylinder, the piston moves forward, then we cool it and the piston moves backwards. This is a heat engine. A heat engine is a way of converting a temperature difference into useful mechanical work. The whole piston is moving forward. This is not random. You can use this to power your car. Heat engines occur in the natural world. Every summer, the sun beats down in the Atlantic Ocean and the ocean gets hotter. A temperature difference develops between the ocean and the air above. Temperature differences can lead to mechanical motion, or in this case, wind. This is how hurricanes form. A hurricane is a gigantic heat engine. Carnot developed an ideal heat engine. It's the most efficient way to convert a temperature difference into useful mechanical work. He argued that the only way that you could do this more efficiently was if somehow heat could spontaneously separate itself into hot and cold objects. But this is impossible. Now actually, there is a way to separate heat into hot and cold objects. But this does not happen spontaneously. You have to put energy into the system. We can actually reverse the heat engine. Instead of using a temperature difference to create mechanical work, we can use mechanical work to create a temperature difference. This is how your fridge works. It's really just a heat engine in reverse. If you push a piston in, that compresses the gas and heats it up. You can then transfer the heat to the outside of your fridge. Then pull the piston out. This expands the gas and cools it. You can then use this to cool the inside of your fridge. This cycle creates a temperature difference. A temperature difference is a way of organizing the heat. 
This lowers the disorder, and it lowers the entropy. But earlier, we said that the entropy of the universe cannot decrease. But notice, this says nothing about the entropy of your room. Entropy can decrease in your room, as long as it's increasing somewhere else. And it is. Your fridge must be plugged in. And so across town, there's a power plant that's creating enough entropy to make up for the amount that you're destroying. If you look at me, I have low entropy. People like you and me, we're not just random collections of molecules. We're extremely organized. Chickens have low entropy and they lay eggs with low entropy. This can happen because of the sun. The sun is creating a lot of entropy, but the sun is so much hotter than the earth that it's lowering the entropy of the earth tremendously, allowing the earth to have highly complex, low entropy creatures like us. Carnot had some of the first key insights that led to the science of thermodynamics, but no one really paid any attention to him. His work was largely forgotten until the German Rudolf Clausius recognized Carnot's brilliant work and expanded upon it. The same thing happened in Britain with William Thompson. Thompson was the first British scientist to be promoted to the House of Lords, becoming Lord Kelvin. Then an Austrian named Ludwig Boltzmann developed the statistical description of entropy that I described earlier. Now, if you're feeling guilty that you're creating a lot of entropy and disorder, you should know that the biggest creators of entropy are actually black holes. In 1972, Jacob Bekenstein developed the idea that black holes have entropy. Stephen Hawking initially thought he was crazy. If black holes have entropy, well, then they must have a temperature. If they have a temperature, they must give off radiation. But black holes suck in everything. How could they be giving off radiation? Hawking thought about it more and realized that quantum mechanical effects around the outside of the black hole actually do cause it to give off radiation. Hawking showed that black holes emit radiation and they have entropy. There's something very mysterious about the second law of thermodynamics. At first, it may seem to have a straightforward explanation. Suppose now that you are in a state of medium entropy. What's most likely to happen in the future? Is it more likely that you will move to a low entropy state or to high entropy state? Well, there's so many more high entropy states that we expect you to move there. Now, at first, you might think that this explains why entropy is increasing, but not so fast. Let's apply the same logic in a slightly different way. Suppose now that you are in a medium entropy state. What's the most likely thing to have happened in the past? Is it more likely that you came from a high entropy or from low entropy? Applying the same logic, there are so many more high entropy states that we expect you would have come from one of them. So we expect the opposite. We expect entropy to have decreased in this case, but that's not what happened. This argument works in one direction. It explains why entropy should increase in the future but it does not explain why entropy was lower in the past. The only explanation for the second law is that the universe must have begun with extremely low entropy. When the universe began, it was extremely, inconceivably well-organized, and ever since then, it has gradually become more and more disorganized and random. Why did the universe start this way? I don't think we have a good explanation. Nobel Prize winner Roger Penrose said, To my mind, this is the most profound mystery of cosmology, and for some reason, it's still a largely unappreciated mystery. Now, to finish this video, let's make some entropy. 